So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are based. And welcome to our webinar on announcing vaccination data uh, for healthcare providers in low and lower middle income countries. My name is Marta Lomazzi. I am the executive manager of the World Federation of Public Health Association. And it is a real pleasure for me to be here today with our speaker and participants to discuss with a very important uh, issue. I will start this webinar by taking a quote from the current Chief Medical Officer of Australia, who in a recent meeting said, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. Because data are key to understand the gaps, to define and implement strategies, and to understand if those strategies are effective or not, and if they really address a specific need. With that in mind, we know that data collection is not the same in every country in the world. While high income countries have a more developed system for data collection, this is not always true for countries that are less developed. And when we have data that are more frequently available for, for example, child vaccination, when we speak about healthcare providers, there is a huge gap in data collection. This is not often the priority or we don't have in certain country, the technology, the skill, the knowledge, but also the time to collect those data. And uh, these uh, represent a big issue because it has a huge impact on vaccination policies for healthcare providers. As we all know, WHO has released uh, a clear guidelines about vaccination that should be mandatory for healthcare workers in the world. But this is not uh, the reality in uh, many parts of the world. And we don't even know in some part if it's happening or not because we don't have the data. So we really need to discuss this topic with our speakers today and define ways to improve um, this data collection and also to create a sense of urgency with uh, the governments, with the organization working on site about, uh, about that, because we really need to change this approach to guarantee appropriate data collection. And I would say also we need to define which data we need, but this is something we'll be discussed afterwards. So to make sure that with this uh, background, we can go to the next step and guarantee a more efficient data collection in every country in the world. That said, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, that is Dr. Dragoslav Popovic, that is the president of the Serbian Public Health Association. He has 30 years of experience in international public health, out of which 20 years with UNICEF at country, regional and at quarter level. His work focuses on health system and vaccine and immunization. His collaboration include WHO, Gavi Alliance, Crohn Agents, UNDP, UNAIDS and USAID. And Dragoslav, first, thanks for accepting our invitation and, and welcome today. And I'm very pleased to give you the floor. And Dragoslav, Dragoslav will uh, briefly speak about the importance of having different sources of coverage and immunization data, as well as the role of MICS surveys and their potential use in collecting data related to healthcare workers' immunization. Dragoslav, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, I absolutely agree, Marta, that this is uh, one of the critical piece of information that uh, we are missing in most of our countries. And um, uh, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm always thinking about actually implications of that um, uh, and um, implications on, on different immunization programs, such as childhood immunization, whether the person who is not immunized himself or herself uh, can really be committed to uh, promote and uh, 
uh, manage immunization in 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 its own uh, surroundings and its own communities. And um, uh, I also in a number of countries we're witnessing every uh, like seasonal flu season, uh, um, um, <laughs> every. A seasonal flu uh, season coming, uh, we're witnessing discussions whether the vaccine is mandatory or not. And uh, that sent a, a very, very bad message to population um, about um, whether the health workers are really committed to um, uh, vaccination or not, and um, uh, and uh, uh, opening this big issue of of trust in in vaccines and immunization in general. Um, not to uh, forget about uh, uh, mentioning what you has mentioned that um, um, we need uh, vaccinated and protected health workers to be able to uh, deliver their piece of uh, of important work. They are sort of help to helpers, and uh, we need them to be healthy, and we need them also um, to be a source of 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 trust and 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 and, and kind of a, um, uh, symbol of of a protection and not uh, not a risk to uh, uh, to to people um, in their own. Uh, family or not to bear the risk for them, not to take unnecessary risk for themselves uh, if they are not vaccinated. Um, when it comes to data, uh, we have, as you uh, pointed out, a very different situation in, in, in very different countries. And I think it's important to um, look at that in a, in a broader context on how we collect uh, um, other information on immunization, and I know that my colleagues will be talking about specific country experience, or Daniel will be talking about, you know, the impact of uh, what we do with the childhood immunization on the healthcare workers. I just want to um, quickly um, refer to 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 um, other important things that I think uh, uh, could be part of our discussions. Um, 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 during this webinar, or maybe later, uh, is that um, uh, when it comes to to healthcare workers' information, I think we need to learn from uh, from other pro programs. Um, uh, we uh, obviously cannot only rely on 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 government data. Sometimes the data is not uh, available at all, and I think that um, the usual practice of uh, uh, really a diversifying source of data and doing different uh, um, surveys to uh, complement the information that we're getting from the government is something that uh, uh, probably could be useful in uh, uh, collecting data on healthcare workers. Uh, and um, uh, going back to that point, uh, I mean, I've been uh, in, involved with the UNICEF uh, multiple indicator coverage surveys several times. We, we UNICEF is doing this periodically for um, uh, 40 years right now, um, just to complement information on uh, that we are getting from the governments on the immunization, but also to to. Um, help uh, uh, immunization managers to um, understand the, uh, for example, exclusion. Why some kids are not getting vaccines? Do they have uh, uh, access to uh, to healthcare? What's the what's the what's the issue with them? Uh, and uh, use that data to to really tailor immunization programs. And when we do this sort of surveys, we are entering communities. We are entering healthcare institutions. But we are missing to ask the questions to health workers to, to whom we are talking. Are you vaccinated? Do you think that you should have access to some more vaccines that you have right now? And uh, what do you think that could be um, uh, beneficial for you, for your work and, and for the communities that you are um, taking care of? And I think that um, the the similar situation is with the, with the, with the other so, so some different surveys that we do DHS in in some countries and a similar kind of uh, um, um, uh, survey mechanism that we have. So um, 
That's just my my suggestion and my plea that uh, in such a surveys, we include also um, healthcare providers, vaccine providers, just to understand better what is their situation or to bring uh, their voice directly from the um, from the field up to those who are uh, policymakers. So I'll, I will stop here and we'll be happy to, to join discussions and, and happy to be with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dragoslav. And I really keep this last point for your presentation to include healthcare workers in whatever we do as a survey. And I believe it will be very, very important what you said at the beginning, being vaccinated is part of the occupational safety. Uh, and that they have the right to be protected and to protect their family. So also these should be part of the discussion with them to make them understand why they may need to spend some time to participate to this survey because they have the right to be protected and they should be part of, of the data collection. Um, that said, I'm very uh, pleased to move our next speaker, um, Dania Arif Siddiqui, the Deputy Director of the Maternal and Child Health Program, FIRD Global. She holds an undergraduate degree from Pakistan, followed by a master's degree in development management from the London School of Economics. Dania's work centers on improving equitable access to healthcare through evaluating and scaling up evidence-based maternal and child health intervention across a range of low and middle income settings. And she also serves as assistant professor at the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Welcome, Dania, and thanks for, for being with us today. Uh, we will hear for you a very concrete example that you run in, in Pakistan and also how it can uh, be applied to our main topic today. So we will discuss also its scalability for healthcare workers immunization data. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you. I'll just quickly share the screen and please let me know if that is visible. Yes. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Good good morning, everyone. Uh, so I just put together a few slides to sort of, I thought it would just help us to visualize a little bit as I walk us through the example of the Zindagi Mefu's Electronic Immunization Registry, also known as the ZMEIR for short. So <clears throat> the ZMEIR is essentially a suite of digital health interventions that is aimed at improving immunization coverage, timeliness, and equity. And it does this by generating real-time geo-enabled child-level data for data-driven decision-making. Um, and before I go into the more technical overview of the EIR, this slide just sort of gives a, the current footprint of the ZMEIR in Pakistan as of last month. Um, so you can see the map of the country on the left. So the ZMEIR was first piloted back in 2012 uh, in the Sindh province of Pakistan, which you can see shaded in blue um, in the south of the country. Um, and then following the positive impact of the pilot in 2017, the government, the health department government of Sindh scaled it up to the entire province. So this province is roughly about, uh, has a population of about 50, uh, more than 50 million people. And then the subsequent years after 2017 saw the ZMEIR being expanded to other regions of the country. And as of 2022, it is in the process of being rolled out as the national EIR of Pakistan. And then the table on the right gives just a brief overview. I'll you know, request you to focus on the top row that gives uh, numbers of the current children and women enrolled. So as of last month, we have more than 10.9 million children and 4.3 million women enrolled in the registry. So in addition to the childhood immunizations, we also give out the tetanus, it also records the tetanus toxide uh, vaccination for women. Um, so we have, again, uh, just to repeat, more than 10.9 million children, 4.3 million women enrolled in the EIR, making it by far one of the largest EIRs in a LMIC setting. And then it has data recorded on more than 137 million individual child-level immunization events. And it is being used by more than 4,400 vaccinators across 2,200 immunization clinics you know, over the country. Dania, sorry. I guess your uh, slides are not in the full screen because we see the main slide and also the next one. Can okay. you please go in full screen so we can see both? Just one, but bigger. Let me see. 
Uh, let me know if it helps now. Is it in full screen now? Yes, now it's as, as before. Let me try to share it again. Maybe that will help. Thank yeah. you. Then if not, it's, it's not a big deal. We see also the slide, but it's not the usual full screen. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you for letting me know. Uh, I'll move on to the next slide, which is just giving a brief sort of technical overview of the EIR. So at its core, the ZMEIR is essentially an Android-based registry that allows the health workers to digitally enroll and track a child's immunization status over time. And it does this by, you know, uh, basic features such as a unique identification QR code assigned to each child. It has a web interface that allows for real-time monitoring through web-based dashboards, mobile-based data entry and access, um, and interactive SMS reminders for caregivers. And then, um, you know, over the last decade or so, the uh, EIR has evolved to incorporate, you know, more cutting edge technology features such as an AI based predictive analytics and AI based chatbot. And then um, some sort of features around more of the supply side of vaccination. So including cold chain equipment management, vaccine stock management. And then there's quite a lot of focus around uh, how we can enable better performance management of the health workers. And for this, for instance, we have GIS tracking of vaccinators, um, you know, micro, um, enabling micro plans for allowing health workers to plan their uh, outreach activities, uh, providing default child defaulted reports to the health workers so that they can, you know, um, see the data and access it in real time. Um, and then also it's interoperable with the DHIS2 using fire standards. Um, and then the, here we have just a brief snapshot of the child level variables that are captured in the EIR. So in addition to, you know, the basic bio data uh, information, such as the child's name, gender, date of birth, um, we also have uh, certain sociodemographic uh, variables being captured, such as the place of birth of the child, mother's education, and then we also have detailed immunization uh, data on the child. So, you know, each vaccine that they have received, the age at which they received the vaccine, uh, and then each individual vaccination event is geotagged, which means you are able to locate every geolocation, you know, where the vac each vaccine dose was administered. So this is, again, as I'll show, very um, useful when it comes to analyzing this data. And then for the vaccinator or the health worker, we also capture certain variables for them. So this includes their name and gender, the immunization center to which they were assigned, their um, EPI ID, and then um, around the performance management, we have information around, sorry, information on their attendance and compliance, um, you know, and uh, the vaccination route, for instance, that they followed as part of their outreach immunization visits, um, as well as, um, again, the, each vaccine dose that the vaccinator administers is likewise to the child, also geotag, so you can, you know, really pin down every location where the dose was administered. And then all of this big data that is being, you know, captured through the EIR, um, we're leveraging that along with the GIS analysis to, you know, generate actionable insights. So here I just listed some of the ways where we're, you know, using the data. I'll give a couple of visual examples of this as well. So, for instance, uh, we conduct geospatial analysis of the, you know, various immunization coverages, the identification of high risk or missed areas, predictive modeling, mapping of climate-induced immunization disruption. Then when you come to the health workers, mapping and tracking of the health worker activity. Um, and then you, really using this data to see how you know, resources can be distributed more equitably. Um, and we're doing this through generating maps um, you know, and hotspots and, as well as um, you know, doing population mapping. Um, so this is just a visual example of how the child level data in the EIR is being leveraged. Um, this particular example shows how we are tracking the zero dose children. So we're going from the macro level at the left, you can see it's the entire province and we um, you know, sort of identify the hotspots, but then we're going down. So we're zooming in from the province to the district down union council and right to the household level. So we can really pinpoint the location of each and every zero dose child. And then similarly, uh, for you know more sort of uh, performance management of the workers, this slide shows sort of a you know um, a, a time wise analysis for one particular union council in Pakistan, which is the smallest geographic uh, administrative unit, uh, and it shows uh, it's sort of been divided into polygons, and essentially we can see that the red areas are the ones that were not visited by the health worker in a particular month. So this slide is from 2020. So we see quite a lot of red area in April, May, June because of the pandemic. But then generally over time, this you know it's just to give an idea that this kind of information is regularly shared with the EPI supervisors, with the health department, so that they can really target you know, actions to where they're most needed. 
Um, and then this slide shows one example of how health worker mobility is tracked via GSM based tracking. So the screenshot at the top basically gives, a, you know, it's a team view feature in the EIR that enables, you know, the EPI supervisors to locate the entire team, for instance, during a campaign or an outreach visit, so where each member is located. And then there are other features such as a root view feature that you can see on the bottom that uh, you can actually track the movement of each health worker, uh, you know, during their outreach. And this is really, you know, essential and important when it comes to monitor conducting remote monitoring of these health workers, uh, both in terms of, you know, the areas that were reached or missed out, or also when health workers, you know, go into security compromise areas. So information like this is very useful um, for, you know, uh, for their own, let's say, safety for them to be monitored. And then just last couple of slides showing how uh, attendance of vaccinators is being tracked. So this is, again, um, you know, example of monthly attendance data packs that are shared with the health department. So we're tracking the attendance by the 30 districts of the province. And as we can see, on average, the attendance was 90%. Uh, for the month of May, and then we can really demarcate the districts where it's sort of falling short. And similarly, the compliance, uh, which is actually defined as whether or not the vaccinators are using the EIR, um, you know, um, for that particular day. And here again, we see the average is around 76%. We do have a proportion of district below 60%, but then information like this, when it's given to the health department, it really sort of enables them to um, you know, take action where, where it is needed. Um, I'll stop there. But my intention was just to open the floor for discussion and sort of give an example of you know, how the EIR is being leveraged for both child level immunization coverage as well as for health worker data. Um, and yeah, I'll, I look forward to the discussion and I'll be happy to answer any questions that come along. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very useful. I I have two, three questions already that I want to ask you, but I will keep for for the Q&A. We have still other two speakers that will uh, provide insight about the situation in their country. The next one is uh, Professor Mohamed Rida Barbouche, MD, PhD, immunologist by training. He sits among the aspects of the Tunisia National Immunization Technical Advisory Group, better known by NITAC. Uh, since uh, 2016, he has contributed to all the regular and extraordinary meetings and contributed to the management of several outbreaks of measles and hepatitis A, as well as analysis of all cases of suspected VDPA. He served as a member of the steering committee of the Pasteur Institute International Network, as well as in different vaccinology working groups at the WHO. And he has also been strongly involved in the response and preparedness to the outbreaks, both at national level and at the level of the Pasteur network. Welcome, Mohamed. It's a pleasure to have you uh, together with us today yes. to discuss the situation in Tunisia, because as we said at the beginning, data collection can be a problem. And I believe that is still somehow problematic in, in your country. So can you please give us an overview of what is ongoing or not in your country and eventually also in, in your region and what can and should be done to uh, change the situation? Okay, thank you so much, Marta, for your kind uh, introduction and uh, thank you for everyone uh, for listening. So uh, I will talk about the situation in Tunisia with regard, I, I will focus, I mean, on healthcare workers' vaccination. Huh? All my uh, talk will be around the healthcare worker uh, vaccination. So what is clear with regard to healthcare worker vaccination that legislation exists. The legislations are there, the, the uh, recommended vaccination are there provided by the WHO as a recommendation. But now between the legislation and the implementation of these recommendations, there's a gap. And this gap is the real problem uh, today. And here I think that a uh, lot is uh, asked from the occupational medicine uh, people. And this is a real difficulty because they have to decide what kind of vaccination would be mandatory, in which situation. For example, we know that people working for TV in our countries, for example, either in the labs or with patients, we will need to have a special algorithm for their uh, uh, testing, for skin tests. Skin tests would preferably be positive. If not, they could be followed or at least vaccinated by BCG, which we know is not perfect for adult 
protection far from that. So it's really sometimes a decision of the occupational medicine people, and this is very difficult. And this is right for many other situations, including uh, for uh, regular things like influenza and so on. It's not easy because there is a problem of cost of the role, the real role, the definition of the real role of the occupational uh, medicine doctors. They are not always keen to do this kind of vaccination. So there are many difficulties. And that's the real problem we should work on. What are the mechanisms by which we could improve the situation? Now, with regard to the situation, we do not have, uh, in, my, in my country, in, in many countries from the Emro region, from the East Mediterranean region, with a few exceptions, we've just heard now from Pakistan and probably from the Gulf area countries, there are some registries, but otherwise, in most of the country, there is no registry. There is no electronic registry in either, of course. So all what we have, uh, data are very scarce. Very, very few data are available in the literature. And maybe I could, I could mention a few of them for Tunisia. And these are, so no registry, so these are hospital-based series. So these are hospitals or inst medical institution or health institution which, which do this work just to see what is the situation uh, in, their, in their settings. So this is, we cannot rely on such data to have a real figure at the national level, but nevertheless, that's, that's all what we have. For example, for hepatitis B, hepatitis B is one of the most recommended, of course, vaccination in, uh, for health care workers. And uh, fortunately, the situation is changing for hepatitis B because now the new generations that are coming to the work, uh, to the, to the workplace have been vaccinated through the EPI programs. But the, one of the studies I found in 2010, not so far ago, uh, was conducted a very serious one with thousands of, of healthcare workers included, uh, showed that we have only 25% of the personnel which have been vaccinated. Only 25%. 4% have HBS antigen. So they are chronically infected probably through their work or other, other place, we don't know. And so 70% of healthcare workers were candidate to vaccination. And this was before a campaign for vaccination against hepatitis B that was conducted in these big hospitals in a few towns in Tunisia. And uh, I should say that the success of the campaign was fantastic with 90% of the personnel adhered and, uh, uh, to, to the vaccination. So it's not a problem of uh, adherence or anything, but it's the dynamic of this vaccination and the way we are doing it actively needs to be actively. And this is what is missing. For tetanus, for example, tetanus vaccination, only 22% of the healthcare workers are vaccinated. Because many of them would say, and there have been questionnaires for this personnel, we would say we are not aware that it is a really a risk for us or anything, anything, things like this. So we need to make an effort in terms of uh, improving awareness of these things among the healthcare workers, for sure. For uh, influenza, for example, only 19% of healthcare workers are vaccinated for many reasons, including the cost of the vaccines. The cost is very high and institutions are not always keen to pay for that. So there should be a national effort, an organized effort to do things. And this is missing once again. So these are the, 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 the areas where we should work really. For COVID-19, COVID-19, we had this epidemic, as you, all of you know, and I should say, well, once the vaccines were there, the adherence was fantastic. And most of the personnel have been vaccinated without any problem, but it was an active way to do it. So this is the difference. How we do these campaigns, uh, this has been uh, the beginning of the API programs, it was like this. But now we have a mechanism. And I think that this is our problem, really. Uh, we should work on that, in my opinion. And the, the, uh, we need to do advocacy for a better first information of healthcare workers. And second, better uh, vaccination programs. And this will not go through uh, isolated action. It will go through only governmental actions. So he, these are the recommendation of WHO should be followed much, much more strictly. And the problem of budget, of financing this, has to, be, has to be solved in one way or another. And finally, I think that in any initiative we would have, 
through this uh, program or other programs, we need to involve all stakeholders. There are many contributing to the potential success of this. Of this. I, I, I'm thinking about the night tags, which, could, which, I, which is not our role in night tags to do this, but could be. The people are sensitized to this problem for, for healthcare workers and could be a way to do it. I think to a professional association for nurses particularly and other professional associations for physicians and others, they should have their role. I think about the occupational medicine departments, which should be involved because they play a major role, as I've described earlier. And of course, we need to adapt things to locations. We cannot do everything everywhere. We are all conscious of that. So we need to have priorities to classify the, our actions in terms of higher priorities, which could be involving all countries, and less high priorities, which could be possible in some areas, but not in other areas. So this is my opi opinion about this, and I will be very happy to discuss with all of you and uh, uh, take any questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, very useful. And I want to really to underline this last um, point about being coordinated, make a system change with all actors involved. But also another point was very key to me to increase the awareness of the healthcare provider. They should understand that they, there is a risk and that they have the right and should be protected for that, which leads to what you said, we need to implement strictly the guidelines of WHO and make sure they are all implemented in, in every country with the flexibility that is needed, but we need to be more, more strict in that. And with that, we go to our uh, last but not least speaker, Chief Dominique Konji Konji. He is a senior public health and communication for development expert, founding member and president of the Cameroon Public Health Association. And uh, he is also a graduate from the University Center for Health Science of the University of Yaoundé, Cameroon, and holds a postgraduate diploma in public health of the Regional Intercountry Higher School of Public Health in Central Africa, Brazzaville, Congo Republic. Welcome, Dominique. It's a pleasure to have you uh, with us today. And uh, we, with you, we will go uh, in depth in the situation in, in Cameroon. As we said, in Tunisia, also in your country, data collection for uh, immunization for healthcare workers is a problem. And we need to find ways to develop it better. So could you please uh, explain uh, your current situation in the country and eventually in the region, highlighting also potential solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear moderator. Uh, to enhance vaccination data collection for healthcare workers in Africa, we need we need to know uh, what are the antigens that that are, are, are administered. And uh, also to know what are those who are uh, mandatory in our in our continent and in my country. Uh, let's say uh, in the African region, let's say Afro uh, with WHO, it's the COVID-19 vaccination that most countries have adopted as a priority for healthcare workers. Uh, in uh, November 2001, for instance, WHO. Africa Region reported that only one in four African health workers fully are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. The majority of Africa's health workers are still missing out on vaccines and remain dangerously exposed to severe COVID-19 infection. This is uh, WHO uh, uh, regional director who says this, and he says. Unless our doctors, nurses, and, and uh, for, uh, other frontline workers get full protection, we risk a block back in the effort to curb this disease. We must ensure our health facilities are safe working environment. Now, a, a sharp contrast that I want to share with you. While a, a recent WHO global study of 22 mostly high income countries reported that above 80% of their health and care workers are fully vaccinated. A preliminary analysis by WHO showed that 
only 27% of health workers in Africa have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, leaving the bulk of the workforce on the front line against the pandemic unprotected. Analysis of data reported from 25 countries finds that since March 2001, 1 million and 1.3 uh, 1 million health workers were fully vaccinated. With just six countries reaching more than 90%, while nine other countries uh, have fully vaccinated less than 40%. So the majority workers are still missing out on vaccine and remain dangerously exposed to severe COVID-19 infection. Uh, then, then we say, based on data reported to WHO by countries in the African region since March 20, 2020, there have been more than 150 uh, 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 150 uh, COVID-19 infections, uh, 150,000, 40,000 COVID-19 infections in health workers, accounting for 2.5 of all confirmed cases and 2.6% of the total health work workforce in the African region. Five countries account for about 70% of all COVID-19 infections reported in health uh, workers. They are Algeria, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. By 2020, more than two, 227 million vaccine doses have been administered in Africa. In 39 countries which provided data, 3.9 million doses have been given to health workers to see that they are vaccinated for COVID-19. And WHO reports that all countries in Africa have prioritized health workers in their vaccination plan. The low coverage is likely due to the availability of vaccination services, especially in rural areas, as well as vaccine hesitancy. Recent study found that only around 40% of health workers intended to receive a COVID-19 vaccine in Ghana and less than 50% in Ethiopia. Concerns over vaccine safety and the adverse side effects of the vaccine have been identified as the main reason for their hesitancy. Health workers are key sources of information for the general population and their attitudes can influence vaccine uh, updates. Update. So, uh, WHO is supporting national efforts to drive up health worker vaccination. And they are currently coordinating trainings and dialogue on vaccine safety and efficacy to help address doubt or misconception around the COVID-19 vaccine, as well as advocating open and honest communication about benefits and side effects of vaccination. Within that, uh, the World Federation of to join hands with WSO to enhance healthcare workers' multi engine engine vaccination and rendering it mandatory. Now, we think also that uh, the World Federation of Public Health Association, with its member associations, should involve themselves in assisting countries in collecting data on healthcare workers' vaccination at country level. Now, we come to Cameroon. In Cameroon, we say since 2021, Cameroon has introduced COVID-19 vaccine of healthcare workers in routine immunization. Vaccination campaigns targeting healthcare workers, pregnant women, and aging persons and people with comorbidity were conducted. And since inception of the pandemic, four campaigns around were organized in the whole country. Only 20,931 healthcare workers were completely vaccinated. There is vaccine existence, hesitancy in Cameroon, even among healthcare workers. A study carried out in the 10 regions of the country reveals that only 
57% of healthcare uh, uh, workers are in favor of this vaccination. And 60% think that the COVID-19 vaccination should not be compulsory. Health professional orders or body, we think should be sensitized to request immunization as a right and involve themselves in data collection and analysis. And we think occupational health is to be more promoted in our country. And I'll end by saying that there is another antigen that is, uh, that is administered to healthcare professionals in Cameroon. It's uh, the vaccine against cholera. But no data is collected and analyzed. So this is the information I had from the API program of Cameroon. Thank you very much. I'm ready to discuss. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique, for this very um, good insight about the, the African and uh, Cameroon situation. And I would like to uh, underline once more your call that we are ready as World Federation of Public Health Association, as well as National Public Health Association members to support WHO or other uh, institution in data collection. So we remain available and I see friends from WHO also connected here and I will be happy to continue the discussion uh, with them afterwards. Now uh, we move to the panel discussion and before that I would like to invite all participants to ask a question in the Q&A. So feel free to start typing any question you, you may have and our panelists will, will pick them up. Um, one first question I would like to ask to, uh, to Dania is, uh, you show us a very good model, not only for data collection and how to use the data for the implementation, for changing, for defining the solution uh, to tackle the, the gaps. What are for you the key consideration for ensuring uh, the successful development implementation of new data collection methods in low and lower middle income countries specific for healthcare workers? I mean, everything that we need, cost, infrastructure, training, etc. Um, so if I just sort of, uh, you know, look at the example of the ZMEIR, a couple of considerations, I think, for, you know, governments, ministries, uh, donors looking to, you know, uh, invest and launch such a product. Um, I think, firstly, it has to align with the needs of the local context. Um, so by that, I mean, uh, at, at the one hand, you know, you have your supervisors who need a certain kind of data coming in. So your, you know, your EIR or whatever, you know, digital tool that you um, implement has to be aligned to that. But more importantly, it has to be aligned with the needs of the end user. So for instance, in all of the work that we do, we do incorporate uh, a user-centric design. So uh, like I mentioned, the EIR was first, you know, initial, the development happened in 2012. And I remember at that time you are, Sort of, we, we worked very closely with the vaccinators who would be the end users. So, uh, you know, down to the details of how they would want to the user interface of the uh, EIR to look like, whether they would want the you know button to swipe from left to right, what kind of language they were more comfortable with. Um, at that point, you know, there were certain health workers who hadn't really used that kind of technology before. So you know, getting them, it was, it was a learning curve for them. So um, there was an effort made to, you know, have them use the smartphones through, let's say, you know, first we uh, made them play some games so that they actually know how they can, you know, use uh, a smartphone. So um, on the one hand, I feel like, you know, that aspect has to be taken into account very, very critically when you're in the initial stages of development. But then secondly, also, you know, make sure that this is not going to be a static sort of platform. You have to keep evolving with the needs of the time. So for instance, the ZMEIR has been functional since almost over a decade now. Um, and it's very different to what it looked like in 2012, but we've constantly made that effort to you know, keep it evolving with the needs of the time. So you, during the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously uh, there were certain changes and adaptations that were taken into the registry to sort of you know, uh, capture the children who were you know, missing out on immunizations during that time. A similar with the you know advent of AI, uh, we are currently working on features that leverage those kind of new technologies. So you just you know keep that adaptability and flexibility at the front and center of the product. And then thirdly, I would say um, 
a key consideration would be to find the right health champions in the government because if you're scaling up at that level um you know at some point you will have to do it as part of the public health system and the government so we were very fortunate to sort of you know find those one or two key champions uh who um obviously not only instigated and sort of like you know inculcated the values within the worker but they ob they actively used the data that was coming through the eir for performance management so for instance in this particular situation the health minister of the province actually used the eir data in the quarterly performance reviews that they had with the districts um, and so that not only sort of inculcated in the health workers that, you know, this is something that they have to do, but they realized that um, this data is being used for driving actionable change. So I think that I would say would be the third. Um, and then again, um, in terms of logistics, obviously, if it's being designed for an LMIC setting, you have to be very cognizant of the fact that it has to be frugal. So, you know, if data connectivity is not available, there needs to be an offline mode. If health workers can't charge their phones, you have to provide them with power banks. So, you know, little things like um, that, um, I, I feel like in terms of logistics have to be uh, kept uh, central as well. Thank you very much. And of course, these little things, as you said, can really make the difference, especially in uh, LMI setting. So it's very, very important. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Travis Love, um, I wanted to uh, ask you with something about uh, your experience your, with, with COVID data collection. I mean, we did for COVID, we vaccinated and we collected the data about healthcare workers almost everywhere. Uh, Dominique gave some data also for Africa. Why are we not able to do that in every single country for all the vaccine for healthcare providers? What we have learned from COVID that can and should be applied to all the vaccination for healthcare workers? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I, I think it's a, it's a question of a, a, of a commitment, and I think it's a role for us to um, advocate for a commitment of our governments to uh, um, not just to measure, but to first to have a, a, a strong programs for uh, um, immunization of health workers, because only if you have a good program, you will know what to to measure and be able to 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 measure that. Uh, um, in a meaningful way. On the other hand, this uh, information that uh, we have that are sometimes scarce, but are, I think, extremely useful for us to, to advocate for that issue. Uh, coming back to COVID, and I'll try to be um, um, a very brief, I think, as um, uh, uh, Madam Dadia was, was talking about this uh, technology is there, and I, I don't think it's a problem. I think in uh, during the COVID situation, Many countries uh, managed to uh, um, uh, to uh, very quickly develop some sort of uh, uh, electronic uh, immunization records that were even providing the certificates for travels for uh, those who are vaccinated in a very and 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 different sort of certificates in a very sophisticated way, and I think that. The, the, the key message there is there is no excuse. I mean, it can be done very quickly. Obviously, somebody don't want to see that. And uh, that's that's something that we need to um, fight with and fight for. Uh, 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 just uh, 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 very briefly, I think with COVID, um, another lesson is that uh, um, uh, COVID was... Um, the COVID vaccination was aimed to cover all adult population. And that means also health workers. And, and, and from the beginning, they were sort of part of this uh, electronic uh, system. Uh, and I think that um, uh, uh, the, 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 the real challenge we have is in a country where we don't have a life course immunization, where we, where we really uh, putting the emphasis on, on the childhood immunization without um, uh, live course immunization. And then uh, clearly uh, the other problems are coming up at the surface, such as uh, I think the uh, colleague from Tunisia was saying, who is buying vaccines for health workers? Who is providing budgets for that? Um, uh, uh, we, we have so much experience with the childhood immunization we need to use the lessons from that to expand uh, and strengthen the programs for the um, health workers in 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 the countries, and I think that's something 
where um, a world federation is, is very well positioned. And uh, I think that uh, we'll try to contribute to that. Thank you very much, Dragoslav. And thanks for this last point about uh, the need to have a focus on live course immunization. That is the first game changer that will lead to all the, uh, the next steps we have discussed up, up to now. Uh, my next question is both for Mohamed and for Dominique. We have heard about the situation in your respective countries and region, but um, what we need now is to create a sense of urgency to make a change in uh, the, the approach to immunization and data collection for healthcare workers. In your opinion, how can we create this sense of urgency? Which are the partners that should be uh, bring in, in, in this uh, advocacy? And which are the best arguments you can use within your specific setting to facilitate this change? Well, I will, maybe I will start uh, by saying that we need to, to advocate. But the first thing to advocate is to consider that uh, that vaccination is a right. The, the, the vaccination of health professional is, is a right. And uh, they, they themselves, the health professionals, should know that this is their right. And they have to, to act for vaccination. You know, we, we, we think what uh, WHO is doing in the in country, uh, promoting vaccination, is good for health professionals. But the health professionals themselves, I think, should be sensitized on the fact that uh, uh, vaccination is a right for them because of their work, what they do, and the fact that they work with the population and they should be pro more protected. So this, an action, uh, an advocacy and sensitization to conduct towards this uh, health professional body uh, uh, medical doctors, physicians, nurses, and all the others to let them know that this is important and that they have an action that they can carry out in the country, in their country, and uh, 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 try to to make sure that uh, uh, not, not all, uh, only uh, the vaccination is institutionalized for them, for many antigens, but also when they are vaccinated, data are collected records exist they have to put in place a record working hand to hand with the immunization program to have these records well uh, uh, kept and let them themselves involve them in, in that but now we have also have advocacy to guide towards the the government let's say the ministry of health and the, the api program for instance, in Cameroon, as I said, uh, 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 they vaccinate against cholera, they vaccinate healthcare professionals against cholera. But these, these data are not collected and processed. You know, this is it's not an indicator. So we, we need to advocate and say that you should include, if you vaccinate against cholera, you vaccinate against uh, uh, COVID-19. You have records for COVID-19. Try to have to consider the immunization against cholera for health professionals as an indicator. You have to build indicators for that so that we collect data and we can share this data. This is what I think. So uh, advocacy at regional level uh, to support WHO on what they are doing and working with them. But the advocacy at national level towards the Ministry of Health and the EPI program, and then advocacy and sensitization uh, uh, guided uh, 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 towards the, the health professionals themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominique. Mohamed, this consideration yes. applies also to Tunisia. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so I, I think that if I could add something, is that generally uh, policy makers, do not make decision unless they have evidence, they have data, they have some information about the, the problem and what they will earn with putting money in the, in the, in the, in the solutions. So I think it's very important to, to give them data about uh, what is going on. In terms of influenza, for example, we now have in Tunisia uh, an electronic registry for influenza. 
it would be very good to have data about healthcare workers from that registry. How many healthcare workers have been getting uh, the influenza? How many of them spent how many days of sick leave? See, think like this, the policymaker need data, data. And this is missing in this area. And that's why it's very important to have champions who will push colleagues or institution or uh, bodies to get and collect as much data as we can. We have some area where we can do things. We have done very well with COVID. We had a fantastic electronic registry for all vaccination for all. So we can do that. At least I think we have influenza where we can do something because there is a lot of loss of working days because of influenza and probably the hepatitis which is of course being solved now because of the vaccination in, uh, in childhood, but it's important. So this is important. We need to help policymakers by providing data. How to do it? This is the question. How, what are the best things to do to, to achieve our, our goal? That's the real question. Now, I think that the uh, organism organization like the World Health Federation could be an excellent catalyzer for this effort. If we know where to knock, which door to knock, which are the institution and the bodies and the uh, 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 association, the, the healthcare worker association that we should target and the occupation and medicine department, uh, the, tar the department, we could together uh, influence the decision of policymaker because without budget, there's nothing to be done. We have experienced it for introducing new vaccines all these last years. It's that's the that's the only one problem. It's not a problem of science. It's not a problem of of capacities to implement the vaccination. It's only a problem of budget. So this is the real question for the policymakers, and we need to help them by providing them data that uh, show them that they will, they will save money, not lose money. And last, just to conclude, I think that WHO has a major role to play here. The recommendations done for healthcare workers are there, but they are not strong enough. And how to implement them is not clear. There is not clear, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, way to do it by the WHO. The WHO should help implement things, not only give recommendations. And this is, that's a little bit missing. And I think that's something also to do at that level, because when the recommendation comes from WHO, as strong as they are, as I believe me, they are followed generally. So th those are the two aspects I wish to, to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we all joined this call to implement uh, the guidelines from WHO to so find ways uh, by WHO governments and other entities to make it happen. And also the other point about a return on investment. Policymakers don't often understand science, but they understand money. So if we make it clear about the return on investment on the cases you cited, like COVID, hepatitis, influenza, and they understand how much money they save, this could be a good leverage really to implement those vaccination and also to that collect data about that. So I'm conscious of time, but I have another couple of points I really want to discuss with, with you. Um, I asked this question to Dania, but I really invite everyone else to join uh, in, in the discussion. Uh, what metrics should be used to evaluate uh, the effect effectiveness of vaccination data uh, collection program for healthcare workers, but in general? And more specifically, we speak about uh, uh, a lot about uh, um, behavior and social change. So should we also collect data that related to behavioral change? And if so, how? Thank you. I can have a quick shot at this. So regarding the first question around metrics to gauge the success of data collection mechanisms, I would put them into like three broad categories. I think at the first level to, to see whether or not, you know, uh, data is being collected, uh, uh, you have to look at the health worker or the end user, you know, uh, metric. So that would, for instance, if I take the example of the EIR, would be something like compliance, whether or not the worker is actually complying. And, uh, you know, you can define that compliance in any uh, way that is suited to your context. So, for instance, 
for us, we would see whether or not the health worker logged in and enrolled and vaccinated at least one child in the working day. So, you know, you have to define that kind of metrics that can uh, really capture the compliance of the end user to the digital health tool. Um, I think the second category would be around uh, looking at the quality of data, so metrics around how accurate that data is, uh, whether there are any uh, sort of, you know, gaps, whether it's being submitted uh, at, on the time, whether it's complete, and you can do this by various different mechanisms. So, for instance, if you have like a paper-based system in parallel to a digital health, you could do like random checks and verify if the data has been collected. Secondly, you could do maybe periodic zero surveys to gauge whether administrative coverage reported through the platform is, um, you know, um, uh, coordinating with the actual immunization coverage on ground. Or you could also, for instance, what we did was random calls to uh, caregivers or parents just to ask them whether or not the child received the vaccine that was reported in the EIR. So I think those are the, some of the metrics uh, around the accuracy, completeness, timeliness of data. And then the third metric I would see is around, you know, your larger impact, which is particularly around immunization coverage. So, you know, what your coverage rates look like, um, uh, what the timeliness of vaccinations look like, uh, you know, and then indicators around equity. So I would broadly put them into like maybe these three categories, uh, the metrics that we can use to gauge the success of immunization or data collection systems. Um, and then your second question around behavior change, social listening, absolutely. I feel like there is such an important role that these, you know, um, strategies have to play, um, particularly, you know, um, looking at how, important vaccine hesitancy and, you know, uncovering the reasons for vaccine hesitancy has become um, today. So, um, you know, uh, uh, looking at vaccine hesitancy, building trust, um, so these are all very important things that I feel like programs need to take into account um, when they're, you know, they're so absolutely critical to designing the interventions. And I'll just give one example of uh, you know, a very basic exercise that we did for HPV vaccination. So HPV vaccination has not yet been rolled out in Pakistan, but um, this is again, as during 2020, we had a small focus group discussions with adolescent girls who would eventually be the target population for HPV. And we just asked them what would an ideal HPV pro, you know, vaccination program look for look like for them? Uh, because frequently we see that we're not really taking into account the views of the target population. And then those girls actually came up with very interesting ideas around, you know, building trust is so important if you were to launch an HPV vaccination and, you, and we would want our fathers to get involved because that's where we expect the most resistance to come from. So, you know, things like this. So I, I would like categorize those things as social listening, um, you know, uncovering reasons for vaccine hesitancy. So I, I feel like that is so important for any new vaccine that is being launched, but also, um, again, and there's so many examples during the COVID pandemic about, you know, monitoring the social media trends, et cetera. But I'll, I'll stop there, but um, absolutely a role, just to summarize, there is a, definitely a role for these strategies. Thank you very much, Dania. And I really keep your last point about making father and allies. And we sometimes consider mothers as allies for vaccine because they take care most of the time of bringing kids to health facilities. And this is a very good point for this type of vaccine. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. I see Dragoslav has opened his microphone and is ready to, to provide his input too. No, I, 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 I fully agree with, uh, with both of you. But when we talk about health workers, we need to also understand that uh, in terms of trust, uh, they are the most trusted uh, of all sources of information around the vaccines. And if they have doubts, and if they um, cannot convey this message about um, a vaccination uh, clearly and, and straight from the heart, then they will not be able to address the um, any concern of, of their patients or population. And um, I think COVID was uh, was extremely uh, strong case where <clears throat> where uh, health workers were actually uh, also creating some of the misinformation and some of the hesitancy among other population. On the other hand, uh, if you are vaccinated, if you believe in vaccines, if you are informed, it's very easy to use that as a key argument when you talk to other people. I mean, if you say, I'm vaccinated yesterday, I vaccinated my family, everybody will listen to you. 
So that's that's a that's a really important to take in consideration this issue about how important source of information health workers are, and if they are not committed, um, uh, we will all have a problem with the uh, trust in vaccines. Thanks. Thank you. So key to get the data also behavioral. Uh, data uh, and so they will help to find also ways to change the behavior if needed. Dominique, please. Well, I, I want to add that uh, usually we think that uh, health professionals are trained in health, they know the diseases, they have competencies and all, and we think that absolutely they have uh, 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 good beliefs concerning those diseases. It's not true because uh, there is knowledge there, there is also perception. So health professional who is trained, he knows what is COVID-19, he knows what is cholera, he knows all this, but he he's a human being and he has his own perception, uh, cultural perception. And we have to, to, to put in mind that after training, a part of training health professionals, we need to have also a, a, a behavior change programs, communication with these health professionals to go into their beliefs and understand if a part of the fact that they have knowledge on a disease, they also believe on this disease and they trust, let's say they trust in this disease and they can uh, 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 promote it to the, the vaccination to the population. And uh, I think there is something to do with health professionals in terms of uh, 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 communication in terms of education, in terms of uh, 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 analyzing their beliefs, uh, because as uh, he said, it's very important when the health professional understand and believe in uh, vaccination, he will be the one, the best one to convince the population. So uh, uh, research is such more researches can be done in uh, behavioral research for health professionals. Uh, and then uh, collect data on that also. Thank you. Thank you, Dominika. Mohamed, do you want to discuss this point? Yeah, I, I think that these are a number of ideas that have been formulated by colleagues. I think, I think as I said earlier, uh, there's a lot to do. How to start? What is the beginning of our action, if any action is going to be to be conducted? So. Uh, what are the champions of such such a work? Because it's a lot of work. It's, it won't be easy as as you can understand it. So where to start? That's the point. With which uh, stakeholders we should start? And the, the, as I said, the, the World Federation could be catalyzer once, once again, and, but where to start and who to identify and where to identify the right people who could help uh, with all these objectives that we have been discuss discussing today. Thank you very much, Mohamed. And we are going uh, to close very soon this webinar. But before doing so, I will ask each of our speakers for one very short take-home message about uh, uh, healthcare workers data collection uh, related to immunization, of course. If you need to give one Suggestion. We know one is not enough, but if you need to start from something, what will be your main suggestion to improve or start or strengthen the data collection of healthcare workers? Daniel. Um, I think for me, it would be the need to realize that I think for the longest time we've been using, and I would use the word using health workers as a means to get to an end, and we just lose sight of the issue that there's such an integral part of the public when we talk about public health. And so I feel like there needs to be a refocus on how these health workers could be made more central to the whole process. So whether that's through training them, whether that's through, um, you know, making them informed about their own health, about the utility of, you know, taking up healthcare services for themselves. So I think from, uh, for me, the takeaway point is to refocus that shift in viewing health workers as such an integral part of the process and an end in itself as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dragoslav. Oh, um, um, I, I, I need to use example. We had uh, a, a month ago in Belgrade, um, 
gynecologists coming to maternity uh, with the measles, um, resulting in uh, uh, nine cases among mm -hmm. staff and um, a number of cases among uh, uh, among uh, mothers and 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 uh, and their children and that's the situation in uh, that really demonstrates how important that uh, um, those who are providing healthcare are protected for themselves and for the others and um and i i love this uh, um demonstration from from Dania I, I think that technology is not excuse um, I think it's it is available and can be easily available it can be easily applied thanks thank you very much Dragoslav Mohamed yes so in, in my opinion the key word is to increase awareness of the importance of vaccination among healthcare workers because there is not enough information going on. And I think that we should inform them better of their needs in terms of vaccination, how to protect themselves, and how to protect people around them, including patients and their families. And this is very important, and it is lacking in many countries. Thank you very much. Dominique. Yes, we, I, I think we have to, to sensitize the health professionals themselves uh, to, to know that uh, vaccination is a right for them and so that they involve themselves in working with the Ministry of Health to advocate so that they are uh, immunized with many antigens and that data, vaccination data are collected. And to the Ministry of Health, particularly the EPI program, that is already vaccinating against uh, cholera, uh, so is to advocate to say, uh, let's collect data and then analyze this data and share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominique. And with these key messages, putting all together, uh, technologies cannot be any more an excuse. We have seen it very clear with Dania. Now we need to refocus on healthcare workers and then make them understand their role, their right, and their responsibility to have really a change in immunization of this target population and data collection. So with that, I would like to thank very, very much uh, our amazing speakers. Thanks for having shared with us your experience, your thoughts, your recommendation. Thanks to all the participants that have been with us today. And thanks also to the University of Geneva and Pfizer who support our work in, in this area.